Psalm 103. Praise the Lord, my soul, all my inmost being. Praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. The life of mortals is like grass. They flourish like a flower of the field. The wind blows over it, and it is gone, and its place remembers it no more. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him, and his righteousness with their children's children, with those who keep his covenant and remember to obey his precepts. The Lord has established his throne in heaven, and his kingdom rules over all. Praise the Lord, you his angels, you mighty ones who do his bidding, who obey his word. Praise the Lord, all his heavenly hosts, you his servants who do his will. Praise the Lord, all his works everywhere in his dominion. Praise the Lord, my soul. This is the word of the Lord. Well, like I said, this morning is part two of a little two-part series that we're doing on Psalm 103. And uh, just to get us up to speed from what we did last week, uh, last week we looked at the first 12 verses of this psalm, and uh, here are some of the observations that we made from those 12 verses. Verses. Uh, first of all, uh, we talked about uh, that a good overview statement might be that Psalm 103 is an invitation for us to get to know God and to get to know ourselves. It very articulately describes who God is and who we are. I mentioned last week a comment from British biblical scholar and author Derek Kidner, who said that it is helpful to look at Psalm 103 as the antidote for two attitudes of the human heart, apathy and gloom. Apathy being, I don't care about God, and gloom being, I think that God doesn't care about me. And it's good to keep those two attitudes in mind as we look at this psalm, being as aware as we can of how is this psalm addressing the apathy and or the gloom in me? Are you seeing anything in here that makes you realize that maybe God cares about you more than you thought he did or in a different way than you thought? And are you finding yourself drawn to him, wanting to know him more? And then in verses 3 through 5, we saw a very specific list of benefits of knowing this God. 
And in looking at this list, we saw that it teaches us as much about our own character as it does God's character. It shows us the predicament that we are in as sinners who need a savior. And we said, why would these things be benefits unless we needed them and were unable to obtain them for ourselves? And hence, thinking about them as benefits that God so graciously gives to us. And we looked at verse 6, which says, The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. We talked about the idea of God's timing and that his promises are no less true just because we have not seen them fulfilled within the deadlines that we have set. And this psalm encourages us to do that difficult thing of trusting in the Lord's timing and in the reliability of his promises, even if they are a long time coming. We saw another list in verses 8 through 10, which tells us so, so much about what God is like. And again, using such beautiful, descriptive language. And right after this list, we saw in verse 11, the reason that he is the way he is, even though as the God of the universe, he has the right to be any way he wants. The reason that he exemplifies and personifies all of these beautiful attributes is because of his great love for us. And then we concluded last week by looking at verse 12, which tells us that the Lord has removed our transgressions from us. Because our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ took our sins upon himself, we do not have to bear the burden, the guilt, the punishment of our sin. Because of Christ, we are forgiven for every wrong we have ever done, and we can live with him and for him forever. Amen. But that only took us halfway through Psalm 103. So let's pick up where we left off. Let's look at verse 13. Verse 13 says, As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. I want to look at two words in that verse. Fear and compassion. First, let's look at fear. The phrase, fear him, appears three times in Psalm 103, in verses 11, 13, and 17. Verse 11 says that God has great love for those who fear him. And here in verse 13, it says he has compassion on those who fear him. And verse 17 says, the Lord's love is with those who fear him. And when we see the word fear, most likely it conjures up Im images in our minds of a very large, powerful God. Maybe he has a stern or angry look on his face. People are cowering in his presence, not looking him in the eye, maybe hiding from him. And we're not just pulling these images out of thin air. There are passages in scripture that give us reason to think of God this way. I think of the book of Exodus, when Moses receives the Ten Commandments from God and there is an awesome display of God's power. Thunder and lightning, the mountains shaking. I think of the times when God struck people dead right on the spot. I think of the many miracles that Jesus performed and often people's reaction to those miracles was fear. Who is this man? 
And the term fear of the Lord certainly should include a healthy respect for the fact that the Lord is in charge. He is not a God. He is the God. No one is above him. No one can contradict him. No one can thwart plans that he has decided will happen. He has every one of our lives in his hands. We're born when he says we're born, and we die when he says we die. Certainly that elicits a certain level of fear. But then there's this other word that is used in the same sentence, the word compassion. This word compassion also appears three times in Psalm 103, in verses 4, 8, and 13. Verse 4 says, He crowns you with love and compassion. Verse 8, He is compassionate and gracious. And verse 13, The Lord has compassion on those who fear Him. And specifically in verse 13, the Lord's compassion is compared to a father's compassion for his children. What is the relationship between a compassionate father and his children like? Well, first of all, I think of the obvious, just the physical differences, the size and strength difference. A compassionate father is gentle with his children. He uses his strength to protect them and to hold them safe, not to hurt them. The children of a compassionate father love the fact that he is bigger than them. The children of a compassionate father love the fact that he is bigger than them. They don't fear being hurt by him, but rather they know they can come to him when life is scary and he will be their safe place. Maybe you have a memory of running into your father's arms as a child if you got hurt or if there was a scary dog. And certainly those of us who have been fathers know that great privilege of having a child wanting to be held and protected by our strong arms. Psalm 18, 2 says, The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock, in whom I take refuge, my shield, and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. This is perhaps a different kind of God than we may have presumed. One who has compassion on those who fear him. A compassionate father is also patient with his children. He knows they are smaller and weaker than he is. They have not yet learned the ways of the world. They do not yet have his wisdom. They are immature, impulsive, inexperienced. He is patient with them as they grow and learn. Moving on to verses 14 through 16, they explain God's compassion a little bit more using this analogy of grass and flowers. Verses 14 through 16 say, For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. The life of mortals is like grass. They flourish like a flower of the field. The wind blows over it and it is gone and its place remembers it no more. I spend a fair amount of time during the spring and summer months tending to the flowers in my garden at home. I love it. I love the whole process. I even, I even love the weeding. 
I love it all. You know, there's something very satisfying about planting this thing and you take care of it uh, and God makes it grow and bloom. It's a very satisfying process to be part of. And when you tend a garden, one thing that you can't help but notice is the temporary nature of the plants and flowers in that garden. The first flowers that bloom in early April are the purple crocuses, the yellow daffodils, and the tulips in all different colors. They're beautiful, but they only last a couple of weeks, and then they're gone. Then the azaleas start to bloom, but then they're gone. And then in early May, just in time for Mother's Day, the lilacs bloom. Many different beautiful shades of purple. And of course, the incredible fragrances from the lilac plants. But then after a couple of weeks, the edges of those lilac blooms start to turn brown and they fade away too. Earlier this week, my rose bushes started to explode with blooms. The roses are my favorites. I wait for them to bloom every year. But each one of those blooms only lasts a couple of weeks at best, and then it withers away, and another one takes its place. Gardening is a stark lesson in the temporal nature of life. It's kind of sad, in a way. Such beautiful, brilliant colors and smells here for such a short time. But God compares us to the flowers. Compared to my life, I have to be honest, the life of a flower seems extremely brief. But God says to me, guess what, buddy? Your life is like that flower. Our lives are maybe 80, 90 years if we're lucky. That can seem like a long time. Although the older I get, the more perspective I get on just how short life actually is in the scheme of things. But the one who invented time, the one who existed before time was even a concept, if you can even begin to wrap your head around that, he must find it amusing that we think 80 to 90 years is a long time. Have you ever spent any time thinking about the fact that heaven is forever? Have you thought about that? Heaven is forever. In heaven, we will be forever praising God together with his saints and his angels. One of the verses in the song Amazing Grace says, when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. And at that point, after we've been in heaven for 10,000 years, don't you think we'll look back at our lives here on earth and we'll say, remember when we thought that was a long time? I can't even, I have to stop thinking about that for too long because my head starts to hurt. But being compared to flowers, this provides us with the proper perspective for these lives that we are living right now. Are we God? No, we are not. God is bigger than time and space. And these earthly lives of ours and these earthly bodies of ours are confined by time and space. And they are limited in how much time we get. Verse 16, the wind blows over it and it is gone and its place remembers it no more. That is sobering, especially when you realize it's talking about us. Now contrast that verse with verse 17. 
from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him. And verse 19, the Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. Words that describe us, gone and no more. Words that describe God, everlasting, established, rules over all. Now, this is not to say that we are not eternal beings. We most certainly are eternal beings. But we must not make the mistake of thinking that our earthly lives are the main event. In the scheme of eternity, our time here is the tiniest fraction of time. And after this life is over, when we receive our new bodies, when we experience the new heaven and the new earth, when we join the multitudes of our brothers and sisters in praising Jesus Christ, that will go on forever. We will exist forever praising and worshiping and glorifying Jesus Christ. Knowing that, understanding that has to affect the way we live this life, doesn't it? Someone who thinks that this life is all there is is going to live their life very differently from someone who sees this life as temporary, as a warm-up for the real thing. The things that seemed so important, so worth expending our energy on, so worth chasing after, suddenly get put into perspective. In his Sermon on the Mount, Jesus also puts this into perspective for us when he said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and then the other necessities of life will fall into place. Don't do it the other way around. Seek first the kingdom of God. And Jesus also warned us in the book of Mark, what good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? You can't bring the whole world with you to heaven, but you sure can bring your soul to heaven. It's a reminder to us to keep the things of this life in their proper place. So this brings up a question for me. I'd like to pose that question to you. Are there areas of your life that come to mind where you may have your priorities in reverse order? Parts of this life that we know are just temporary that will be destroyed and gone once this earth is replaced by the new earth, things that will not matter at all once you have moved on to the next life, but for some reason you are treating them as if they matter more than they really do. I can think of a lot of areas in my life where I do this. Areas that could use maybe some tweaking, or maybe even be cut out completely. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, or if you're thinking about being a follower of Jesus Christ, if you believe that this life is not the main event, that eternity with Christ awaits you, how do you recognize, what does it look like to give something in this life more importance than it deserves. How can you recognize when you are doing that? The amount of time in each day that we spend on this thing. The amount of money that we spend on this thing. The energy that we spend worrying about it and thinking about it. It's different for each one of us. What is it for you? I would encourage each of us here today to spend some time meditating on this. Maybe even invite the Holy Spirit to advise you 
Which parts of my temporary life am I treating as though they had eternal importance? And conversely, what aspects of eternity am I not paying enough attention to? Again, that's going to be different for each one of us. Psalm 103 ends the way it starts. Did you notice that? It is very neatly bookended by this phrase, praise the Lord, my soul. Now that's a fairly common poetic device to begin and end a song with the same phrase. But in this case, it also serves a purpose. When we see praise the Lord, my soul, at the beginning of this psalm, David is preparing us for everything that we're about to read about the Lord. He's saying, get ready to learn why the Lord is worthy of our praise. And then he spends the next 20 some verses telling us, and then he concludes with, praise the Lord my soul, as if to say, I rest my case. And notice those two words, my soul. Not my mouth or even my brain, but my soul, my entire being, the deepest parts of me. My emotions, yes, but even deeper than that, the places in me where my deepest feelings and motivations come from. Praise the Lord from there. And this is what God wants from us. This is the kind of relationship that he longs to have with each one of us, where we are praising him from deep within our souls. The absence of this kind of deep praise is what God was lamenting in Isaiah 29 when he said, these people worship me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And Jesus referenced this verse in Matthew 15, that same phrase. Our Heavenly Father gave us Psalm 103, this beautifully written description of who He is, of who we are, and of what life can be like if we choose to fear Him, love Him, and know Him. He gave us Psalm 103 to read, to really take it in, to think about it, and to be moved to worship Him. Not just to say the words we know we're supposed to say or sing the songs that we're supposed to sing every week, but to be filled with awe and love for Him in our deepest parts responding to the incredible truth that the God of the universe loves us this much. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for revealing yourself to us the way you have in Psalm 103. Thank you for not keeping your identity a secret from us and just leaving us guessing about what you may or may not be like. Thank you for revealing yourself. And thank you that what we see here of who you are is somebody that we want to continue to get to know, somebody that we want to love and worship. Thank you for your love and your compassion and your care for us. Father, I pray that each one of us would find time today and as the week goes on and as the busyness of the week closes in on us, that we would find time to meditate on some of the things that we've seen here in this psalm. I pray that the things that we've seen here would cause us to have a more realistic understanding of ourselves and I pray that a true understanding of who you are 
would work its way into our soul and that it would cause us to love you more and worship and praise you more. Thank you, God, that your throne is established and that you rule over all and that that is a dependable and reliable truth. And most of all, we thank you for the greatest demonstration of your love and compassion for us, your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And it's in his precious name that we pray all of these things. Amen.